Vicki Lenane and welcome to Embrace Therapy Podcast. I am a practicing art therapist based in Ireland. In each episode, I will interview guests from various fields of therapy and well-being with the aim to encourage healing through embracing therapy. On today's podcast, I'm joined by music therapist Bill Hayesy. Bill works with children and adolescents who are visually impaired. He has experience working with acquired brain injury, mental health, developmental disabilities, and those living with dementia. He is a prolific researcher with some articles in the British Journal of Visual Impairment. He did a national survey of creative arts therapists in Ireland, which can be seen on the website Polyphony. In this podcast, we talk about the things that inspire him and the importance of creativity in supervision. We also talk about how he went to Australia and Spain for education. It's a really rich story and I really enjoyed having this chat with Bill and I hope you enjoy listening. Here is Bill Hayesy. Okay, so Bill, you're very welcome onto the podcast. Thank Thanks you so for, much for coming on. My pleasure, Vicky. Thank you for having me. Um, and you're a very busy person, so I really appreciate uh, you you spending some time with me and Absolutely. linking in. Yeah, I really do. Um, so just for people that are listening who don't know who you are, would you mind just telling us uh, like a brief introduction of who you are and, and what you're up to at the moment? Sure, yeah. Uh, well, I'm a senior music therapist and um, I suppose I have a few different roles. Um, I work in the HSC with older adults a couple of days a week um, and that's a post I've been in for about 13 years now. Um, and as part of that kind of carry out individual work and group work with older adults with a variety, I suppose, of age related conditions, including dementia. Mm -hmm. um, and um, a big piece of that work is a therapeutic choir that I've been running since 2009, uh, which started as a research project uh, looking at the effect of choral singing on mood and cognition and quality of life for older adults. Um, so that's one kind of piece of my work. And then um, the other uh, clinical part, I suppose, is working with children. And I work across a couple of schools um, and really working with children and adolescents from four up to kind of, well, up to young adulthood, really up to 22. Um, and they're a variety of people that I work with, I suppose, people with visual impairment, um, people with autism and other maybe intellectual disabilities, communication difficulties, uh, emotional difficulties and, and, and so forth. Um, and then uh, I'm also involved in the training program at the University of Limerick. Oh, wow. um, I've been involved there since about 2011. Um, so um, I, uh, I suppose I supervise students who come on clinical placement. I supervise about six students a year. And that's the part of the work that I really like, I suppose, um, in just kind of supporting students to learn and grow. And um, then I also do some lecturing on, on the course a few times a year. Um, and then recently, in the last few years, I've set up a supervision practice for music therapists. And um, so I supervise professionals in their working life. Um, but that's kind of my my kind of professional, um, I suppose, uh, load, if you like. Uh, there's a lot of variety in the week, mm. um, but uh, I enjoy that and uh, enjoy all the different aspects of it too, you know, so. Yeah, you, you wear many different hats. Uh, mm. it's, it's very mm. impressive. I think that's the beauty again of cre being a creative arts therapist is yeah. it's so varied the work that we do and yeah, every day is different. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I am, I'm going to ask about the part of you that does the supervision mm. and how you bring in your creativity to supervision and, and how important that is. Cause mm. I, I know for me, I wouldn't want to see a talk uh, only. Uh, supervisor and that's sure. a personal choice but what do you find 
when you're doing supervision works for you? Um, well, I suppose it really depends on the supervisee and what they need or what they 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 kind of are drawn towards. But um, I suppose sometimes bringing in music, of course, um, um, have brought in song composition in the past um, and also uh, visual art um, a little bit too. And um, really kind of whatever the supervisee needs, um, you know, so I, I think um, sometimes, you know, I find supervisees are working out there, a lot of them, especially self-employed, you know, if they're coming to supervision once a month, there's quite a lot for them to process and to talk about. So it really depends on, on, on kind of where they're at. And then obviously the stage of uh, development too, I suppose, younger professionals who maybe come out of university need a lot more support at the beginning um, and sometimes assistance in setting up posts or looking at doing pilot projects and uh, the research side of things uh, too. So yeah, I suppose it's very broad and one thing I love about it is I suppose the unique I suppose experience each supervisee uh, brings and um, yeah so that's kind of very rich part of it I think yeah. Yeah, and it's lovely again to to be working with professionals, you know, to to be doing the work and passing on what you've learned, you know, sure. that's Absolutely. so lovely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think um, it's great to see now, I suppose, um, when I came back to Ireland in 2008, uh, there was very few music therapists on the ground, you know, um, there was a few posts and there was a few people I knew working in the city here, but now i suppose the course has grown um i think they have 18 this year mm -hmm. um so in first year which is phenomenal actually um you know when i when i was first back and i remember taking on a student for on, on a placement for the first time i think there was five in the year so um and then what's also really positive is that i suppose um, there, there seems to be a lot more opportunities out there too. Um, Hilary Moss and Lisa Kelly just carried out a graduate survey of the last five years, I think, of uh, graduates. And it was very positive in that a lot of them are working in music therapy. Um, and I do think um, in a way, I mean, I suppose things like Instagram and Twitter and social media have really helped creative arts therapists and private practice certainly um but i do think covid in a way was a very positive thing for our professions in that it made us think outside the box a little bit um and i suppose gave people opportunities for new ways of working and i think that's kind of carried on and i suppose people have upskilled a lot and can probably offer more than they could previous to covid so i think that's that's positive you know yeah, I think yeah. you're right with that. I think there's something about uh, creative arts therapists, especially, and the responses to, you know, the pandemic or like, you know, that hardship, I suppose, that that, that we respond very creatively, you know, Absolutely. that's in our nature and yeah. Yeah, yeah. come up with these ideas. And <laughs> it's great. It's really yeah, good. It's, it is. Um, yeah. You said there when I came back, so just for everyone listening, you did mm. go abroad to study. You, you went to Sydney, Australia at one time. Yeah, yeah I did. I um, I had been traveling in Australia and other places for a year and I kind of had thought about coming back to London actually to study in the Nordoff Robbins course there. Um, but I really liked Australia. The climate helped. And, <laughs> going to the beach and Sydney is a very nice place. But um, I got the opportunity to apply for a couple of courses over there and I got accepted into the Sydney one. And yeah, it was a two year kind of opportunity to train out there. And um, it was a great experience. You know, um, I suppose music therapy has been kind of present in Australia since around the 1950s. So it was a lot more developed and there was a lot of options for clinical placements. You know, my first was in a private practice, which was fantastic. Wow. Um, and then I had a couple of placements in older adults care and mental health in schools. Um, so it was a really great learning curve and a really great opportunity. Um, and then I 
then I was in, I actually went to Cadiz then because I started some research at the end of my uh, Sydney course. Um, and there was an opportunity to do a research masters in Spain. Um, and yeah, so I, I kind of moved from Sydney to Barcelona, brushed up on Spanish, and then I moved down to Cadiz for a year and a half and wow. uh, took on a thesis there. So um, that was a great experience. And I suppose really, um, ignited my kind of love of research and and that so it was a really a really positive step for me i think uh, before coming back here so yeah, yeah. it's it's, it's such a beautiful journey you know yeah. to i know a lot of irish people do like mm. traveling it's kind of in us to to yes. go and no you know yeah exactly yeah. we really yeah. are um and and to go to sydney and i i guess for me i have um some friends in in sydney as well who are working in this kind of profession and and they love art therapy they love music therapy they constantly mm -hmm. say that like they're on the team with them they work yeah. with them yeah. you know and i think we're finally kind of catching up with that here yeah you know? i think um yeah for sure and i i suppose um i found in australia i suppose it was a great understanding of creative arts therapies and certainly from my perspective music therapy and in one school I, I was in actually uh, Giant Steps, it's a school for children with autism and there's I think there's well there's one in Australia and there's I think one or two in Canada and one in the States um, and it was a fantastic placement, it, it, it was uh, a preschool, a primary school, an elementary school and a secondary school oh, wow. now in each of those departments they are in each of those sections there was maybe 15 children but the way they they had always had music therapy there there was three full-time music therapists there and um the day was basically run certainly the mornings were run by a speech therapist and a music therapist uh together and with a real focus, I suppose, on social communication and social aspects. Mm. Um, so it was really, um, really a central part of the education, you know, in that context. So it was really fantastic to see and also to see, I suppose, in my first placement there, a thriving private practice where, you know, it was such a, a, an important part of the community. Um, so, yeah, very positive, I suppose. And, put it, um, I suppose, uh, filled me with maybe confidence that Ireland would, you know, uh, develop in this way and that there would be more opportunities, which there certainly is now, I think. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and like you said, there's like 18 in first year in, mm -hmm. in the music therapy in Limerick now. So it's yeah. just showing you how yeah. it's growing because now people are finishing secondary school and going, well, why don't I just go for this career? You know, whereas yeah. before it might have taken them like myself an extra 10 years of trying to get there, you know, yeah. Yeah. taking yeah. ages to, to find it, you know, yeah. where it's, it's. I think uh, that's true. I mean, certainly. I remember in when I did my degree in music in Cork, there was an opportunity to do a music therapy, uh, uh, the module, mm. and you had to choose kind of your preference each year and you didn't always get your preference, but I think I put it down at least twice as my number one, but I never got it like the wow. introduction to music therapy. So um, that was kind of that. And then, you know, back then, I suppose I, I remember, um, I mean, I'm trying to think, I mean, there was internet, but YouTube wasn't as advanced as it is now. Yeah. And I remember just even like kind of getting a book on music therapy um, and then kind of going, OK, I think I have a kind of idea. And then writing to Nordoff Robbins in London and them sending me over a pack, mm -hmm. which I read. But I mean, I still didn't really understand it fully and I, I think even in starting my course in Australia I mean I don't think I really understood it I suppose there wasn't just kind of that much about it you know in the media or on YouTube or on the internet so it was much harder to access then uh, so I think now for kids and for students coming out of school they could be more um, aware of it certainly so I think also probably um, you know that means that in a sense sometimes trainees are a lot younger than they were previously too you know and i certainly see that uh, that uh, people are going straight from a degree 
into uh, creative arts therapy training, you know? Mm. Yeah, I'm definitely seeing more and more of that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just great because then I just feel like that passion is a little bit more alive or something. Yeah, so it's great. It's really lovely. Um, you're mentioning there as well, like your passion for research uh, and, and how that really started in Spain mm. um, and well, in Sydney, but kind of grew and blossomed a little bit more yeah. in Spain. And you you constantly seem to have your toes and fingers and lots of different types of research. Mm. And um, I just think that's so exciting because, mm. you know, it, it really helps when we, you know, have evidence to prove what we do and, mm. and can really prove it in, in the way that you do as well, which is lovely, um, you know, by giving examples and, you know, I think that's really important for the work that we do more than any other profession. It seems to yeah. be, we need to prove it a little bit more or yeah, something. Yeah, and I think, I think I've always, um, I suppose I've always been conscious of that um, and especially in coming back to Ireland, you know, where things weren't developed at the time. And, you know, in my first role, I suppose I was hired to carry out uh, research on, on the therapeutic choir. So that was kind of a good marker for me and what could be done in a year, you know, and what level. Um, but, you know, I remember as well doing a couple of other projects um, one with ABI and um, another one in mental health in the HSC. And even with that one, you know, it was a seven week project and I ran that with a speech therapist actually. And a huge part of that mental health group was around positive communication and social communication actually. Yeah. Um, and even in kind of evaluating that in a very simple way, I mean, we did carry out kind of pre and post tests, but with, you know, I think there were seven participants. So, um, but, you know, the important part of that uh, program was we did a focus group at the end where a separate occupational therapist ran that, recorded it. And it was really those kind of client experiences that were so important and really stood out. And actually over the course of that program, you know, it was often the participants talking to their psychiatrist about the program that really sold it. Mm. Um, so even small things like that, like doing a simple survey or a focus group or something very short, you know, can really support a program and hopefully create possibilities for uh, repeating it or for the funding to be there for it, you know. So, um, yeah, I think research is very important when you have a growing profession like ours and it doesn't need to be complicated, you know, but yeah. I think evaluating in some way is is a very important part. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you did this beautiful survey and um, the National Survey of Creative Arts Therapists in Ireland in 2020. Mm -hmm. And for us, like it was just it was just so clearly laid out, you know, and I really appreciated it. And I'm sure everybody in Ireland is did because you know, it, it was just so clear. And even for people, like you said, uh, finishing a degree and, and looking at this as their career going, oh, that's how much I could make. Oh, okay. You know, I didn't have a clue. <laughs> Do you know what kind of I would be looking at, you know, and even something so, so simple like that, just to see, um, and, and to see if, you know, I could be part of, of something like, yes. um, an MDT even, you yes. know, Sure. really simple but you know you laid it out all there for us to, to see you know with with things like that so um well i think that kind of that survey kind of grew uh, a lot of legs in a way um i'd spoken with icat because when i was on council a few years previously i'd done a very uh, like a much shorter salary survey um with some extra questions uh looking at kind of areas of practice and theoretical foundations and and so on but I think um yeah this one just kind of grew um <laughs> a lot um but it was it, you know as I was doing it and as it was growing I I just felt it was important to kind of map this because it hadn't yeah. been mapped before um and there had been one done on music therapists in the UK which was um a reference that I 
used um this one expanded obviously when you're dealing with four professions also it's it's um um a lot uh richer um but it was interesting i think you know there's a lot of data in the survey um i suppose the salary aspects and that are of interest to professionals mm -hmm. and uh, the rates for sessional work and so forth but you know i think some other interesting things were in that it revealed i suppose the integrative approach that most creative arts therapists in ireland seem to take which isn't the same necessarily in all other countries i mean certainly i know in music therapy will say you know more integrative and eclectic approaches would be more associated with australia scandinavia um you know belgium and holland and the uk would have been more so psychodynamic in approach but certainly in ireland it seems uh, you know there was certainly a majority who you know worked in a more humanistic and uh, integrative sense um and there was also um you know i i think almost half of creative arts therapists integrated other art forms into their work which was fantastic to see yeah. um so a lot of people were using embodiment and movement and dance and visual art and play and mindfulness and you know bringing other aspects into their work um and i suppose that's exciting and um really shows a profession becoming more confident and um i think when um when i certainly started the thought of bringing anything else in i would have felt very underconfident to do that and you know you know i should just focus on the music and um but i suppose really when we follow the client you know there are other ways that we can draw on and obviously we're not saying that we're that type of creative arts service but there's certainly aspects of the arts and from other uh, creative arts services that we can bring into it to make it richer and make it more dynamic for the client and um, meet, I suppose, uh, the needs that the client has. Um, and um, yeah, I suppose the survey then looked at as well supervision and um, uh, I suppose we're, we're uh, um, I suppose there, there's a very high uptake for supervision in this country, which is excellent, and CPD also. Yeah. Um, and that was something that certainly um, Creative Arts Service in Ireland wanted more of. They wanted more CPD. Um, and I think ICAT has been fantastic in, um, I suppose, developing more CPD um, throughout the last few years. Um, and then, like other things, you know, uh, Creative Arts Service. I think one of the main further trainings that people did was around counselling and psychotherapy skills. Um, and that was also something that people said they wanted more of in their training programmes. So I think there is a need possibly for extra extra coverage or provision of uh, verbal skills, certainly. Um, and I often wonder if it would be um, really helpful for maybe creative arts therapists in Ireland to be able to do an add on year or something that would give them a kind of, a, um, you know, that kind of psychotherapeutic verbal skills that maybe it's not possible to cover all of in the programs because the programs are so full, you know, mm -hmm. and I mean, I suppose when you're dealing with um, uh, uh, clients from four years old until, you know, the end of life and everything in between it's a lot of pressure on the courses to cover everything yeah absolutely so, um, yeah mm. and, and and because we are using different forms of communication as well there's a lot of mastery in that so absolutely it's so hard to to get everything in um mm. and i do think you're right there there isn't quite an equal um amount in in the colleges i suppose and it's something that i are definitely looking at to 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 equal that playing field because it is very, it is very important um you know so mm -hmm. i think you know this survey was just so rich in its findings and it's still to this day you know being brought up all the time you know it's 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 brilliant and uh you know, you know, we really commend you for for doing well, it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mapping that out. <laughs> well, look, it's uh, you know, I think it's you know, I I think yeah, I, I mean, it's it's uh, something that probably needs to be done every seven years or something like that. Or, but it's certainly very interesting to see where people are working, the different kinds of clients that people are working with. 
and even in identifying maybe those areas that aren't kind of um you know that there aren't as many creative arts therapists in i suppose even for thinking about new job opportunities or client populations that perhaps creative arts therapists can work with um so i think that's 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 really uh interesting to see and then as well seeing the actual posts you know and where the posts are um i think you know that's a great thing to be able to share with you know prospective employers and and to say well actually there's you know these 15 permanent art therapy posts across uh, the country and you know I suppose being able to include that in maybe a proposal uh, just to highlight that mm -hmm. is um, a very uh, positive thing as well for yeah it really service. is for anyone yeah for anyone in the profession if they wanted to develop a pilot like you're saying to have this mm. data is to support them is is, is fantastic mm. um mm. And, and not only that like you're constantly writing in journals as well so one that I just spotted recently was the British Journal of Visual Impairment and, and the title was Boom Boom in the Zoom Zoom Room. I just thought that was beautiful. <laughs> I was like, that's such a lovely name. But like, it's true because, you know, you're just talking there about the different kind of client groups that we have and, you know, working with visually impaired with music. It's yeah. just like, that's just beautiful. You know, I, I really think what a, what a beautiful client group to to be working with. Um, and, and this journal you know is you know very reputable and it's lovely to see your your work there but how was it for you gathering that that research about the pandemic and using zoom yeah i mean i had kind of i kind of thought about writing a piece for this journal for years really because there is very little out there on music therapy with children and adolescents with uh visual impairment um and I suppose like just other things came up and time and uh, I didn't have time maybe and but I kept kind of thinking I'd like to put something together and to reflect the work that I've done um, and look COVID was just the, the opportunity I had time in my hands right. and um, so and look it was a learning curve for me hugely um, I suppose um, when when we were working from home at the beginning um i started to think about what i could do for the clients that i work with and families and that um so i started to the first thing i did was just kind of i suppose um putting together online resources that were currently there now i had for the last number of years had a youtube channel where i had videos for you know maybe videos for social skills or different songs for, um, you know, language and lots of different categories that parents could access. Mm. Um, and also uh, videos with sounds from the in, 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 environment that uh, children could listen to. And um, mm. so I suppose kind of putting all of those together and and then I had recorded some uh, material as well for families was the first step. Um, so I suppose just everything that was currently there. So that was kind of the first tier. Uh, this was based on a model that was published during COVID. Um, but I suppose I, I, I had started and I I kind of moved organically through this, but then other therapists were obviously doing the same thing. So when I saw this model, it really um, allowed me to kind of place the work across the different tiers and over the time of COVID. Um, so that first tier was all about what's available online. Mm -hmm. So I put together a few resource packs, which I shared um, and stuff I found online from other creative arts therapists also and play therapists and just kind of resources I thought would be useful for families. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second tier, if you like, was then the um, the uh, I suppose playlists that I put together on YouTube. So I set up a channel and then I started to record myself singing various interventions for families. Um, and I just added to this every week so families could access it and um, I could, you know, I put together simple ideas for a program like you could use this uh welcome song with your child and then maybe move into this 
the movement piece and oh, then great. maybe play this instrument song mm -hmm. and then do um, a mindfulness song, you know, so it's kind of to give them five or six activities that they could do over half an hour. Um, so that that was that was received quite well. And I was doing videos as well on the school Instagram account as well for families and that. So it was a totally new experience. I mean, you know, um, at the beginning, you're just, yeah, video, you're just cringing, you know, you're mortified. Oh, but you get used to it. I mean, I think everybody had to just get over that, you know. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> but so then I then the then the third phase of the work then I suppose was just offering the online session. So they took the form of individual sessions and um, a group session as well. Um, so it was really around this group <coughs> session that I decided to uh, evaluate it over over the month and a half. Um, there was a very mixed group, um, mostly of kind of uh, children of maybe eight and nine plus. Um, but the needs were broad. You know, there was um, one girl with autism who was verbal. There was another boy with severe and profound needs, who, um, you know, and uh, severe intellectual disability. Uh, uh, so there was a really broad range, both of children in terms of their visual impairment and then in terms of their other um, secondary needs. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting to, I suppose, to facilitate this. Um, I learned a lot about what's possible, what's not possible, as I'm sure many creative arts therapists have done over this last year and a half. Um, but certainly with this kind of mixed group, um, it was very interesting for me. Um, and parents were involved to some extent, um, certainly, you know, for children who needed support and that parents were very involved and that could sometimes, you know, range from maybe hand over hand if they needed support in accessing an instrument or it could be just in gently prompting the child or just being there to support them. Um, so, yeah, so then, um, carried out a survey of the parents then and uh, was really just kind of uh, interested in how they felt the online experience worked for them, for their child, how their child engaged in the sessions. Um, did they notice anything, you know, about their child after the sessions? Were they more engaged or were they more interactive or social? Did they uh, vocalize more perhaps and, yeah. and so forth? Um, and um, yeah, so the response, the response was very positive. Um, of course, parents were struggling at this time and I'm sure any support they could get, they would have responded positively to. Um, um, but, you know, I suppose there, it was received very well. And um, there was um, the themes when they were analyzed afterwards, I suppose there was a lot of supportive uh, data looking at you know how it actually helped the bond between parents and yeah. children and it gave them um the meaningful activity to participate in uh you know and um i think for parents um yeah i suppose they identified a lot of positive impacts then in relation to individual children be it you know increased communication or generally more regulated um and you know, also as part of this, then certainly they highlighted that the recorded playlists were a real support because they could be used then during the week or in between the live uh, sessions to support their child. So um, I'm sure um, there's a couple of parents in particular, who, you know, they said, oh, we have your your uh, recordings on every day. <laughs> They're absolutely sick of my voice at this stage. But, you know, I, you know, I think um, overall it was a very positive uh, response and um, yeah, it challenged me in my practice and in facilitation, certainly, and uh, just thinking outside the box um, in terms of, you know, I suppose one of the challenges of online work for music therapists would be uh, improvisation is quite challenging in an online space. So that kind of um, group certainly improvisation and even individually i suppose because of the time lag it's quite difficult to 
improvise in the same way that you would in an in-person session. So I suppose it's exploring all of the different uh, opportunities and experiences you can offer that um, meet the needs of uh, the people you work with, you know, and just thinking about that in an online space. So, yeah, yeah it was um, a really a really great learning experience overall for me and um, it's a new wonderful. experience for them. <laughs> and and like even just a simple thing of like having those playlists brings structure to their day. You know, like it, there's a bit of routine in it and and that familiarity as well. So um, sure. oh, it's just so nice to have those mm. um, and the resources kind of piece as well. Like um, there's so much importance in those because, Absolutely. you know, parents didn't feel equipped and they yeah. had, you know, a lot of children that were very dysregulated at the start and not knowing what to do and feeling yeah. helpless. So it's, it's lovely. And I think even um, some of the parents were, you know, saying that they they really value the music and helping to structure either part of the day or a certain activity or, you know, an activity of uh, daily life for the child that they could use uh, the music before the activity or as part of it. And um, yeah, that's, to bookend uh, it, like, yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. And I suppose it the whole thing really opened up also the kind of communication flow for me with parents who maybe I wouldn't see that often in the school setting because the kids are transported in and out. So mm. um, it was a really great way of sharing and a very instant way. And I suppose if I think now, if I decide to create something and put it out there, you know, they can all uh, access that. And that's a really positive thing, you know. That's huge, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I really think that is um, something even in my work, you know, um, it would have been really challenging a lot of the time to get reviews with both parents or, mm -hmm. you know, like sometimes it's, you know, it's very important that the caregiver and the, the wider family network are involved. Whereas sure. now it's like Zoom. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I can, we can do this now. It's, it's, yes. it's totally possible. Yeah. Um, so, so much learning. Um, yeah, brilliant. Um, you know, I, I'm going to ask a little bit more about you just yes. because we have talked a lot about the things that you do, but, yeah. you know, as a music therapist for you, what, why, why the music part? Because I, I know you, you studied music. So, mm. but okay. how did, how did music find you, I suppose? at the very um, start <laughs> how did it find me yeah. um well i i think it's um it's it's always been part of who i am mm. um and um ever since i was young you know i mean my earliest memories are of singing with my aunt you know um uh when i was maybe four and five and playing the piano with my other aunt um and it's really always been there i suppose my my father and mum used to sing together and go to parties and play guitar and do harmonies you know, in the late Lovely. 70s and there was a lot of music in the house you know um and my dad was involved then in um community drama and working with people in rural ireland who'd never been on a stage before and putting together these really inclusive kind of variety performance shows, you know, that that included, you know, um, you know, farmers who were in their 70s who never really sang or or been on a stage to young uh, people from the community. So mm. there was a lot of music that came from that. And, you know, although that, you know, wasn't drama therapy, it was certainly very inclusive and really impacted the lives of the people who were in the performances and the shows. Um, and I think that was that that was a big influence on me. Um, but I I did art and music for the Leaving Cert and I just started art in third year and I loved it. Um, so I, I kind of had the two, but I, I went with music because I'd studied piano for years. I suppose I felt a bit more confident with that. Um, but yeah, um, I suppose training was uh, fantastic in Cork. There was such an access to everything from gamelan to choir singing, to jazz, to mm. African drumming, to 
trad music, composition, everything. So almost too much in the sense <laughs> that I finished my degree and I got a job in a restaurant, you know. I mean, I just didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and there wasn't that much career advice back then, you know, pre you know, just before you finished. So, um, but, you know, music continued to be, I suppose, a huge part of my life and um, singing myself, playing guitar, uh, making music with friends. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess it's always been there um, and continues to be a huge part of my life, be it playing music, going to gigs, uh, having a dance, uh, whatever that may be. Um, it's certainly, and it's it's been there through thick and thin, you know, I mean, I suppose it's been there for the happiest occasions. Um, I remember my mom's 60th birthday, we had this surprise, we had a dinner on the barge on the canal here, you know, and then for the after party, I'd rented a room in the uh, Dillon Hotel with a grand piano and I put together a songbook of about 200 songs and we just had a sing song for five hours, you know, wow. of the cheesiest power ballads and <laughs> the most fun songs you can think of. Yeah. Um, then on the other hand, I suppose music's been there in the sad times too. You know, uh, my father passed away when uh, he was uh, when I was 30 mm -hmm. um, and I sang three songs, two in the church and one at the grave. And um, my uncle died a couple of years ago uh, very suddenly. And again, music was a really big part in supporting me through that and other people too. Um, but it was a beautiful contrasting thing. Um, my uncle loved Leonard Cohen yeah. and his name was uh, 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 Abraham, um, Abe for short. Um, so over the few days before the funeral, um, I decided to rewrite the Leonard Cohen song so long Marianne and change it to his name. So, um, and kind of wrote the song then about his life and um, different aspects of that. And it was very cathartic. Mm. Um, it was very uh, poignant. Um, a lot of people obviously uh, were very affected by it. Um, but at the same time, music as part of that funeral was very um, he loved to laugh, you know, he wasn't sad at all. <laughs> so we contrasted that with when he came out of the church, we had the Clonmel uh, brass band play when I'm 64. You oh, know? So fantastic. Was really joyous, fun, uh, and that's how he would have liked to go. So, yeah, music has always been there, you know, through, I suppose, like us all, you know, I suppose through the sad times, the happy times, um, and all of, yeah, all of the different times in our lives where, yeah, we feel a multitude of things. There's always music or a song that'll match it or I suppose help us maybe come out of it or feel a little more easy or be a little bit easier on ourselves. So yeah, it's, it's great huge that part of life. It's great that you get to give that gift to your clients then as yeah. well, you know, to to give them what you've learned and what mm -hmm. richness you've got from music mm -hmm. and to to give that back to them and, and, and use it in that way. So mm -hmm. through it's bereavement perfect. or loss. Oh, yeah. But you can tell the passion that you have for it, you know, uh, and as you're sitting here telling me, you know, I really feel it, you know, it's gorgeous. Um, and, and it is embedded in your, your family history and yeah. And then it shines just through, through you and yeah, the people are very lucky uh, to have you. <laughs> yeah. I'm the lucky one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I suppose, um, you know, it's, it's really inspiring, you know, um, and the the fact that like we can still lean on our craft as well you know mm -hmm. and and the art is still part of you you know you yeah. didn't necessarily choose it but i'm sure it's still there with you, sure. you know? absolutely. Yeah. absolutely yeah. actually i did a i did a fantastic art therapy program there before the summer uh with some um graduates or some final year students in the training program and um it was just wonderful. Oh, it was brilliant. Just wonderful. Uh, and so I, I'd be very keen to 
experience some more. Um, it was just really fantastic to do an hour and a half of that a week and to have that time to explore in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I found it really beneficial and really insightful, really insightful. I think sometimes through visual art, it's a lot easier to, I suppose, to maybe project or to, you know, obviously sometimes in music, I think, you know, I suppose our mode for for this, I mean, in songwriting, it can be fairly straightforward, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a lot more accessible, but sometimes in improvisation, it can be a little bit more abstract, you know, because with music, it's happening in the moment. Yeah. So when it's over, we don't have anything to look back on unless we, uh, record it, you know, and also for, you know, a lot of clients I would work with, um, maybe those who have cognitive impairment, that kind of level of, 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 of abstraction mm -hmm. is difficult, you know, I mean, it can be simple maybe to represent a feeling in the music, maybe, you know, but I, I suppose through the art therapy experiences I had, <laughs> I mean, the things that came out and the things that they brought up and and then I could look at it and keep it and hold it. It was quite powerful. So um, it continues I, I, on. Mm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I suppose every every creative arts therapy um, has has its kind of elements and kind of the ways that it works. Um, but I, I, I absolutely loved the art therapy experience I had. So um, yeah, it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. But I mean, everything, I suppose it's nice to move out of your own medium as well. Uh, Definitely. You know, <laughs> doing some movement or drama or play or, you know, any of these things, I think it's good for us. Mm -hmm. And um, in my training in Sydney, the um, the course director was uh, originally she'd been a scientist, you know, like a microbiologist. Wow. And then she went and studied expressive arts therapies uh, in Switzerland. And then she went and did music therapy last. So as part of our training, we did a lot of modules on uh, integrated arts therapies. So we did a lot of movement, a lot of drama, a lot of art. Uh, uh, storytelling and poetry as well. So it was really fantastic. So um, yeah, I think it's really healthy to to kind of move into other areas that you aren't can, your own. Yeah, the, yeah, there's no harm in that. Yeah. Like, yeah, it yeah. can only be good. That's so true. Yeah. Um, oh, that sounds gorgeous. Like, gosh, um, I, I'm mad about movement. So yeah, I, I think. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, I think that's. I, I suppose dance would have been maybe the first thing that I remember oh, the earliest yes. memories. Yeah, definitely. Beautiful. And then and then singing. So, okay. yeah, I do dabble. Yeah. <laughs> and then the drama as well. I, I do. I do um, playback theater. So oh, a little amazing. bit of improv in that great. as well. Great. So and it's just Fantastic. gorgeous. Yeah, really rich. Um, and yeah, thank beautiful. you so much, Bill. This has been so lovely. Um, but if people want to get in touch with you or if they want to um, find your research and, and maybe have a look at it or, um, you know, want to touch base with you to get for supervision, what would sure. be the ways that they could find you? Um, if people want to go onto the iCAT site, my profile is on there and there is uh, links to different research papers that are out so if people are interested in those they can have a look at those and my email is on that as well so if people want to drop me a line ever there's never a problem and i'd be happy to get back to anyone who's interested in music therapy or music therapy research or anything really so um yeah that's probably the best way fantastic and it's a lovely page some beautiful images on that actually as well it's lovely Ooh, yeah yeah, yeah. Really um nice. So thank you very much. And um, it's just been a real pleasure. And I, I think we could probably talk for a lot longer, but I won't keep you. You're a very busy man. Um, so yeah, I guess it's just up to people if they want to find out more, they'll just go on to the iCat website and and take a look and uh, your YouTube channel as well. If, if people wanted to go on, it's, it's there for people in the public, is it? 
if people email me i'll send them a link because oh, it's uh, lovely that's a, that's a private link for for this for the uh resources but uh there's no problem there i can send it on yeah. yeah, I can imagine some some people listening being like, that's exactly what I need. And um, so thank you so much, Bill. This it's has been, been gorgeous. It's been my pleasure, Vicky, and congratulations on the podcast. And thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.